welcome to the May 18, 2016 City Council meeting. Please stand for the invitation and Pledge of Allegiance. Our Heavenly Father, we ask thy continued help and understanding in our council decisions made today. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly and even now while we are placed among things that seem to be passing heavenly away, to hold fast to those that shall endure, we ask that you give us wisdom and make the right and proper decisions and continue to hold us in the palm of your hands. Amen. 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 Thank you, John. You're welcome. Uh, let the record reflect that all city council members and officials are present. And we have a couple of special proclamations and presentations, the first of which is National Safe Voting Week, presented by Council Member Wine. Great, thank you. It's my pleasure and honor to uh, present this joint proclamation. Uh, whereas the United States Coast Guard Auxiliary, the Peace River Sail and Power Squadron are joined with the Punta Gorda Border Boaters Alliance and promoting education about safe boating for all of our citizens. And whereas for nearly 90 million Americans, boating is a popular, popular recreational activity and whereas it is a fact that 650 people die each year in boating related accidents. 70%, 75% of all persons that go overboard drown and 84% of drowning fatalities were not wearing a life jacket. And whereas the top five factors contributing to boating fatalities were caused by operator inattention, improper lookout, operator inexperience, excessive speed, and alcohol. And whereas most of those boaters who lost their lives by drowning each year would be alive today had they worn a life jacket. And whereas modern life jackets are more comfortable, more attractive, and more wearable than the styles of years past and deserve a fresh look by today's boating public. Now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, does hereby proclaim the week of May 21st to 27th, 2016 as National Safe Boating Week and urges those who boat to boat smart, boat safe, and wear it, and to practice safe boating habits at all times. Passed and duly adopted in regular session this 18th day of May 2016, City of Punta Gorda signed uh, Rachel Keesling, the mayor, uh, and accepting will be uh, Ron um, Ludwig from the Peace River Sail and Power Squadron Commander and Virginia Bryant, the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary Flotilla 98 Commander. Excuse me, sir, I'm Mary Kennedy. Virginia is out, and I am the Vice Commander of the okay. Coast Guard Auxiliary. Okay, okay. to say a few words at the podium, please. Thank you. For the record, Ron Ludwig, Commander, Peace River Salem Power Squadron. I just want to commend the uh, council for recognizing the importance of voting to our community and especially safe voting. And the, at the start of Safe Voting Week, which is this Saturday, Peace River Salem Power Squadron will be conducting our annual marine safety products um, demonstration day at Gilcrest Basin uh, over by the uh, Punta Gorda Boat Club and we invite all members to come. It'll be between 10 and 1. Uh, we were supported by the fire department as, we, as always. You get an opportunity to practice some of those, uh, uh, using some of those safety devices that you carry on your boat. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. For the record, Barry Kennedy, Vice Commander of Flotilla 98 here in Charlotte. Uh, thank you, distinguished com commissioners and Madam Clerk. On behalf of the U.S. Coast Guard, the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and Flotilla 98, we humbly accept and thank you for issuing this proclamation, declaring the month of May 2016 as National Safe Boating Month in Charlotte County. We go for the whole month, not just the week. May marks the kickoff of the year's National Love the Life Wear It campaign.
campaign for all of North America, including Canada. In addition to the basic life jacket wear it part of the campaign, there are six other safety factors that we wish you to consider. Don't drink while you boat. Take a class to learn the rules of the road. Schedule a safety check for your vessel. And that's with either the auxiliary or the power squadron. Check the tides. Make sure you've got enough water to go out and check the weather. Communicate. Have some way to communicate. Uh, marine radio, cell phone, something. And remember, cell phones don't always work out in the water the way they should. File a float plan. Leave how you're gonna, where you're going to go and when you expect to get back and what you're driving. Um, hope to see you at our major highlight activities this month. Open house at Station Court Myers Beach on the 21st of May from 10 to 5. They will do demonstrations, tours, boat rides, and displays. Thanks again for acknowledging this very important life jacket awareness campaign. We are your auxiliary, proud members of the coast of the team Coast Guard, this community, and we remain Seth Paradis. Thank you for Thank you. Thank you. And next we have the Sun Guard Public Sector 30-Year Partnership Award. Good morning. Good morning. Just real quickly, uh, those of you that are in the audience, you probably wonder what in the world Sun Guard Public Sector is. Well, we provide basically almost all the software that helps the city run, from getting your utility bills to paying your bills online to your police department, product called OSSI, to your finance department, other financial software, top to bottom, and uh, we're excited that uh, most times with software you think it turns over so fast and so rapidly, but we have a real partnership here in Point to Go, and we're really excited about the fact that uh, we've been partners for 30 years, and uh, that's, that's an awesome thing. And so at the conference, at our annual user conference, we presented uh, the award for 30 years of partnership, because it's not that you're our customer and we're not your vendor, we're real partners, and we're really excited about that and hope that it continues for 30 more years. So we just want to present this and thank you for being our customer, being our partner, and look forward to great things in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll put this back in the box so we don't. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning. For the record, Joan LeBeau, Urban Design, and it is my pleasure to introduce um, the Arbor Day program that the city is well known for. Uh, we are, a, it is a planting tradition. It is our 22nd year performing these services to the community. Next. We'd like to thank our sponsors. Without their support and donations, we would not be able to carry on this tradition. And our sponsors this year were Mosaic Corporation and the Florida Forestry Service. We also want to thank Mayor Kiesling this year for her introduction um, at our, our, her welcoming remarks to our students at the Arbor Day celebration. She wrote a poem and it was so well received that we have placed it on our Arbor Day wall up on the third floor. So if you're ever up in the city manager's office, please stop by and read it. it it's a cute little poem and we really appreciate the extra spirit that you show in that day. Um, as I said, this is our 22nd Arbor Day celebration. We had three elementary schools with over 368 students, over 50 volunteers, and um, nine new trees were planted. They were mahoganies, and they will be, um, the kids can go back at any time and see how well they're doing. Next. Oh, two slides. Oh, okay. <laughs> As part of our presentation, the children are greeted by Smokey Bear from the Flourish, uh, Forestry Service, and the, it's just the highlight of their day. And then we go through um, a variety of stations where the students learn how trees affect the community. Next. We also do an Earth Day program now. Um, we've expanded slightly. We have 125 students from the Meadow Park School who come over. It's a big class trip for them. And we explain about uh, planting trees and recycling pollution and things of that. We get them started on, on their journey through life with um, trying to save the Earth. It culminates with the big poster in the 
um, in the middle there, and it's their handprints on trees, and then they get to bring that back to their school and display it in their um, main area. Our next is um, our Arbor Day Tree Academy, and again, this is another <laughs> award-winning program that the city does. We go into the fifth grade at Sally Jones Elementary School one day a month for nine months out of the year. We teach um, over 100 students usually, and we have about 20 teaching hours placed in this in addition to the prep time, as well as the, uh, we culminate with the poster contest. If you turn around, um, we have the posters behind us, and all the kids who participate get their, um, their poster on that, and it is displayed in the school as well. Next. This year's themes were trees are terrific in all shapes and sizes. And since that program went so well, we expanded several years ago, um, I think it's on three now, Jerry, with the Downtown Merchants Association. And with that, I'd like to introduce Jerry Priscilla, the Downtown Merchants Association. They, they ha allow us to bring the posters downtown and we display them. And then you, the people who visit Gallery Walk that night, get to vote on your favorite choice. There are no rules and any poster can win that contest. Good morning, everyone. Jerry Purcellar, President of Downtown Merchants. Um, we had a, a really exciting evening at Gallery Walk, if you weren't there. We had about 230 people came down just to vote for these children's posters. Uh, and People's Choice Award was uh, interesting because it was so close. But uh, we just want to thank you for letting us be involved with the city in this, and we expect to do it again next year. So we enjoy it. Uh, how exciting, again, around 230 people voted for the People's Choice. And this year the winner is, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> it was so close, it was so close this year, I mean, it was really close. I mean, we had two people, one had 87 votes and one had 86 votes. So we decided since it was so close, we'd give the 86 runner-up a t-shirt as well. So uh, Nathan, Ezzy, would you please come forward? Thank you very much. Now the winner, the real big winner is Brianna Toner. Brianna, come forward, please. And we got a couple of prizes for you. We got a $50 year worth of money at the Downtown Merchants Association. And on the back of the dollar bills, you will find any place you can go to spend that money. Okay? So enjoy that. And then as well, we have your T-shirt. Here's the winner. Can you tell us about this? Well, um, I was drawing this to my friend, and she gave me the idea of drawing trees onto the side in different colors. So. Oh, cool. Good point. There you go. Thank you so much. And enjoy. Put your picture right over there. Again, I told you it was exciting, and it really was. We had a big, big crowd down there for Gallery Walk, and thank you very much for all your participation. We can count on your support next year, right, Jerry? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> next slide. Now we get into the actual award. Oh, we have the special award. Um, Mayor Kiesling likes to present the artistic award. And again, this is her choice, no rules. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes the rules are a little too constrictive, so I like to look at all of the artwork and decide what my favorite. And it was tough this year. There were some really imaginative drawings that really caught my attention. But the winner is Tacoa Bostic, the Mayor's Artistic <laughs> Choice Award. <laughs> so 
you get a $25 gift card. And the cool thing about these gift cards that our urban design team does is that they actually print their artwork. So even after you spend your money, you can keep this card as a memento to remember Arbor Day and that you won the, the award. So that's very special. And then uh, I got you some really cool coloring things to continue your artistic talents. And then you get this beautiful presentation to put on your wall. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, our third place winner is Natalie Garcia. And Natalie is not here today, so we will make sure she gets her award. Our second place winner is Christian Velasquez, who also could not. Oh, I. <laughs> <laughs> Christian, you won second place in this contest. So with that, we'd like to give you <laughs> Christian receives a $75 Visa gift card, again with his uh, winning drawing on it. And he can keep that when, you're, when it's done. It can be used anywhere. And then... like to present you with a certificate for display with of your poster as well as your certificate. If you'll go to there. Joan. Hey Joan. I kind of take pictures. <laughs> Did she get it? Okay, come on down. All right, and our first place winner, I think she knows who she is, <laughs> Kylie Flowers. Kylie receives a $100 gift card with her poster on it as well as her certificate for display. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> Joan, do you want them all up there? And if we could have all of our winners come up to the front so we can take a group shot. And hold your, hold your certificate open. Why don't you go down here? Thank you all for participating. We'd like to thank our city council for their attendance at the event. Our sponsors, again, Mosaic and the Florida Forestry Service, as well as the staff and volunteers who go to great lengths to put this uh, production on. It is not easy in the behind the scenes. A big credit goes to Julie Ryan, who constantly, year after year, keeps us all in tow and on track. So thank you all, and we invite you next year to April 28th, the 23rd annual Arbor Day celebration. Thank you.
I'd just like to take a moment to thank Joan and the urban design team and all the other staff members. I mean, she hasn't just taken this to the schools. She's gotten the staff involved. She's gotten the community involved. I mean, you've really taken this Arbor Day thing to the next level, which is really exciting. And for, you know, 23 years of programming, that's impressive, Joan. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, next we have a presentation on the minimum city contribution to the Firefighters Defined Benefit Pension Plan by former Mayor Bill Albers. And now we roped you into another job <laughs> here. He's on our Firefighter Pension Board. Yes, and it is a little odd on this side of the, uh, the podium. <laughs> um, good morning. Let, why don't you just pause for one second? Oh, sure, absolutely. Sorry, we gotta go take more pictures. Okay. No, <laughs> it's a new effect. <laughs> no, I lost my touch. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Bill Albers for the record representing the Fire Department Pension Board. And let me set your minds at ease, this uh, presentation has absolutely no effect on this year's budget at all. <laughs> I'm here to ask you to consider a minimum contribution of 12% annually to the fire pen prevention pension plan and, and let me explain each year the pension plan actuary completes a formula and instructs the city how much it needs to contribute so that the pension fund meets the state's mandated um, levels and that performance the performance of the various investments play a key role in the compilation of that amount from 1996 through 2006, investment returns were very strong, and the city's mandated contributions were very small. As you can see, for five of those years, they were zero, and the balance were very little. The average contribution for those 11 years was $19,000 a year, or 2%, 2.1% 2 of payroll, covered payroll. To put that in perspective, in 2014, for one year, the city's contribution was $460,000, or 29.2% of covered payroll. Instead of considering the future, the city council at that time opted to use those funds for other purposes. Imagine that. And, and therefore, when the recession adversely affected our investments, the city contribution was adversely affected and it had to be increased dramatically. So for the next following years from 2007 till today, as you can see the annual contributions averaged $306,000 or 19.1%. This certainly created additional anxiousness. The sky was falling for many residents during very unsettling times. Back in, oops, back in 1996, had the City Council had the insight to impose a minimum contribution of 12%, irrespective of what the actuary asked for, instead of an average of 19%, excuse me, pardon me, instead of $209,000 in total contributions, it would have been 1.18 million, because the average would have been 108 instead of 19. That would have changed the following nine years significantly. And none of this includes compounding now. I didn't get in, well, at least in the lower part, into that depth. The following years would have changed those contributions from $306,000 to 198 average. And instead of the 19, it would have changed it to 12.3. Now that didn't include compounding. It certainly would have reduced the pain of the recession and today's fund would be a lot higher and I'll just give you a little taste of compounding. It was about a million dollars more that would have been collected in the first 11 months. And compounding with the actual returns of the top nine years, it would have added another half a million dollars. In spite of the poor uh, financial markets, it still would have been a half a, dollar, a half, half a million more. So a million in the lower would have been collected, it would have been a million and a half in the lower part, I didn't even compound. So as you can see, it's a lot of money. 
Um, so why the history lesson? Because the past can and will repeat itself, and with a few really strong investment years, you could be right back in the same position again where the actuary could tell you, you really don't need to do, you only need to do 10% this year or whatever. You don't need a whole lot because it compounds so quickly. We all know what goes up must come down, um, and it will. So I, I'm, we're suggesting that you flatten the uh, impact by implementing minimum contribution, which will smooth the peaks and valleys and allow the fund to grow. Our request is that you make this change by ordinance, if you agree. Uh, this will give our citizens a right to comment about it, and it will also make it difficult for future councils to simply discard it. Originally, we were just talking about making it a financial practice, but frankly, I know from sitting there that financial practices can just be waved away with the, with the wave of a hand. So ordinance would be the way to do it. And quite obviously, if you agree with, with this concept, it would be apt for all three pension plans. I'd be more than happy to uh, answer any questions, and I really do appreciate your time. Questions for Bill? Nancy? Um, what is the unfunded liability of the pension plan? I, c I couldn't tell you. I don't, yeah, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I think that's you know, one of the things we're trying to look at, because as you well, it would, as, it you, would. as you describe here, uh, when we're told we don't have to contribute because we did get some, in, uh, the, the fund grew, mm -hmm. so we're not contributing. Yeah. Um, and I think it's a concern of, of, I'm sure, the people that participate in the plan as well as um, we all should be concerned about that unfunded yeah. liability that's looming out there. So. Well, and the, the unfunded liability would not be what it was had we done this 20 years ago. I mean, we can't go back in time, but the reality is this could repeat itself. And whoever's sitting there at that time may simply say, oh, great, you know what? We have another $300,000 to do something else with this year. And that's really not a good solution. You, you, it really just makes so much more sense to never pay less than that 12%. Again, you look at those numbers, we're at 24% for uh, 2014. And I mean, there's some big numbers up there that could have been a whole lot less. And again, I didn't take into consideration compounding, so the numbers would have been much less. And I think, too, the smoothing, it's more of a smooth way of budgeting. And that way, it's going to be built into the budget. If it does show signs of going down, then the 12% is there and that, the, you know, it's in the budget. And um, like you said, looking back, and, you know, you've talked about this for years, and now that you're on the board, I, it's coming to fruition. So um, looking back, it would have been a really smart move to, to do something. Kim? That's exactly what I was going to say. I think it's a great idea, and um, that's why we wanted you on the board. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we talked about this before. I, I think it's just a great accounting practice that we, we should do to make sure that that doesn't. Howard, then Tom? No. Tom, then Howard? Uh, Nancy, with regard to the unfunded liability, I got this from, from Dave a, a couple of weeks ago. The unfunded liability for the, both the police and the fire total $4,109,770 as of the end of September. So that's where we are with the unfunded liability. I, I believe that this is a, a good thing to do. I think we should do it. Uh, uh, certainly include the, uh, the police. I have a concern about the general employees because of the nature of that pension being closed. I wouldn't want to do it for the general employees without getting some input from the actuary and uh, perhaps the, uh, the the fund manager, because of the nature of the, we, that the general employees fund, just by virtue of the fact that it's going to be a closed plan, the investment is going to change from equities over to fixed income over time. So I would like to get some additional input before we make that commitment for that particular fund. And, and I agree. Uh, Dave and I just talked about that. I think it's applicable for the general fund, but at a different percentage, and you'd have to find and that. Yeah, we don't know that number. But the, same, but the same concept applies. I mean, the same thing could occur. Maybe it's 6% or I don't know. And, what and it is, maybe, but, but I, don't, I don't know if 12% right. is yeah, the right I, number. Easy, easy enough to find out, but clearly police and fire fall into this 12%, and I don't mean to speak for the police pension board, but I can't imagine that they wouldn't want to... Uh, adopt this as well and I think if we have consensus to move forward with an ordinance we would have all that backup material and be able to make those decisions with the language Gary uh, I I'm, think this is an incredible concept it's the it's the way to go it seems that uh, from a governmental standpoint it's hardest to save when times are good and it's most difficult to save when times are bad and this kind of 
forces that issue, that when times are good for us, then we can afford being uh, the bad times uh, uh, much more easily. Uh, and I would assume that if 20 years down the road after this has taken such a great hold and we find that we've overfunded a pension fund, Wouldn't hopefully, nice? <laughs> then we can turn around and revisit it. Okay. But I mean, that would be the ultimate goal is to get everything to the point that it's going to be self-sustaining and I think that this is the moral way to go. I, I will share with you that when, after I made this presentation at the pension board, at, when the meeting was over, the actuary and the plan manager came up to the podium and said this would be the smartest thing the city council could ever do. So thank you. You are very smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, for police and fire, it, it financially it has zero impact for, and it will have zero impact for a number of years. We put in so much more. It's a good thing to do. I, well, I will say this though. The fact that we didn't put a whole lot of dollars in those years that you looked at and then we had the downturn, forced us as a city to revise the benefit structure, to get the plans more in line with other communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We may not have done that if we were funding it at that 12% level. Interesting, I just, but it's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to do. Well, I think that that's a good point that you raise is, is it's good to make sure we are funding the plans, but that does the reality is important. So should we move forward? And yes. Oh, yes. 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 Okay. Tom? No, I, I was just going to say, I have an inclination <laughs> that that issue would have ra rose into the sur risen to the surface anyway. But, but <laughs> So do you want to go to your last slide? Because I know you had the recommendation up there. Do you just want to put that up for I'm the sorry. viewing public? Sorry about that. Um, the pension board is requesting that the city set the ordinance for a minimum contribution to the firefighters to find benefit of 12%. Uh, even if that rate that the actuary stipulates is below that level. And again, we would certainly ask your consideration for the other two pension plans. It just makes sense. Yes. We have yes. consensus. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Just to clarify, we're not including the 12% for the general employees at this point in time. What we're going we'll to do have to rely on some recommendation <coughs> from staff when we the language comes through. We'll come up with some. Yeah. Okay. Now is the time. If your name is has been submitted for a board or committee and you would like to introduce yourself, now would be the time. Any nominees for a board or committee that would like to introduce themselves? Okay, seeing none, we move on to our public hearing agenda and we have PD 02-16. Yes, this is the first reading of an ordinance, which I'll read by title only. An ordinance of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, amending ordinance number 1178-97, subsection 3F, as amended by ordinance number 1205-97, clarifying the use of the gated access point on A. Klein Road. Amending ordinance number 1178-97, subsection 3Q10, as amended by ordinance number 1205-97. Removing reference to the number of entrances and adding a new paragraph 11, providing for replacement of existing driveways with conditions, providing for conflict and severability, and providing an effective date. Good morning. Uh, for the record, Terry Tubbs, Urban Design. Uh, this ordinance, uh, this amendment was brought forward by the uh, President of the Property Owners Association. Uh, the actual use of the gate on Ackline Road is not changing because of this. this. This just updates the language in the ordinance to reflect how the gate is currently being used and has been for the past several years. Uh, the other issue that recently came up is a property owner, uh, their driveway needed to be replaced and it was wider than the 24 feet that is currently al allowed in all other areas of the city. Since Seminole Lakes was built with their own stormwater uh, system, uh, the driveway width was taken into consideration when they planned that. So allowing them to replace their driveways with what the width they w were originally built with uh, would not have a negative impact on the stormwater. So the Planning Commission and staff do recommend approval of their request. Any questions for Terry before we open the public hearing? No. 
Okay, this is a public hearing. If you would like to speak on PD 02-16, please come to the podium, state your name. You will have three minutes. Anybody to speak on PD 02-16? State your name, please, and then the timer will start. Good morning. I'm Bill Murphy, president of the Seminole Lakes Property Owners Association. Uh, thank you for the, uh, a good explanation of this. In 2009, after several years of uh, a disturbing increase in the number of uh, break-ins, and more so the number of unauthorized vehicles entering Seminole Lakes, by piggybacking uh, cars through the back gate. The board at that time uh, assigned a committee of residents to, to study the situation and uh, make a, come up with a recommendation uh, to, to solve the, the problem. Part of the problem at that time also was the fact that the electronic system at the back gate uh, was worn out, it was outmoded, <clears throat> Parts and supplies were no longer available, so it was it had become such a problem. We were using nothing more than simple garage door openers, uh, which every appliance repair truck in town had one that uh, could open the back gate. There also was a, uh, we haven't mentioned much of this, but there was a very uh, a dangerous situation created by the fact that it was common for one, two, three, or more vehicles to be stopped on Ackline Road waiting for a resident to come in the gate so that they could piggyback them in. And <clears throat> that obviously was a, was a dangerous situation. In 2000, late 2009, the committee recommended to the board that that gate be closed and uh, all new electronics be uh, installed at the front gate, including electronic <coughs> entry as well as uh, recording, uh, electronic recording of all vehicles entering the, 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 the system. The interesting thing is immediately, uh, almost immediately, the number of break-ins went to zero and uh, the, prob the safety problem on Ackline Road, uh, we no longer had the vehicles stopped. <clears throat> we still do occasionally have people waiting to sneak in when a car is leaving, but uh, that is pretty minimal and uh, not much we can do about that. The system has worked very well now in the last uh, seven years, almost seven years. So uh, uh, as she mentioned, this uh, the wording is just to clarify the language to reflect what is actually happening at the gate uh, rather than what was uh, guessed would happen <coughs> in 1992 or 1993. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bob Toth, I'm Vice President of Seminole Lakes POA. I was president when uh, this decision was was made to uh, close the gate. Uh, there was very little opposition, but I would want to thank the Terry Tubbs and her department for doing a good, great investigation study. The Planning Commission did a wonderful job. They, uh, they asked uh, Charlie Council and others asked some very tough and difficult questions and we answer those truthfully. There was a little bit of opposition uh, by a couple of residents, but I would not consider that expert testimony. It was mainly opinions. I think ours is more uh, expert testimony. So we appreciate what everyone has done and we hope you will pass this ordinance. Thank you. I'm Sherry Danko and I'm the Community Association Manager for Seminole Lakes Property Owners Association. And my office is the office that will receive the complaints typically from the association members regarding issues going on in the community. And I can say over the years since the gate has closed, although I've heard anecdotal comments and conversation with folks, I've only received one formal complaint on this issue from 450 owners. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else to speak on PD 02-16? Now would be the time. Last call, PD 02-16. Move to close the public hearing. Second. Yes. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously.
Move approval PD 0216. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve PD 02-16. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you. We do not have any quasi-judicial public hearings or, or uh, second readings, um, but we will move to the consent agenda. And first, I would ask council members if there's anything they would like to pull from the consent agenda. No, thank you. No, thank you. No, no? Okay. Um, we will have citizens' comments on consent agenda items only, which would be the approval of the minutes, the legal department invoice, a resolution and urban design division and the police department training room technology enhancements. Anybody like to speak on those issues? Okay, seeing none. Move approval of the consent agenda. Second. second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carried unanimously. Okay, now we will move into our regular agenda. The first item we will have is citizens' comments on regular agenda items only, which would be um, the appropriation to the Peace River Minnesota Water Authority, the ADA assessment plan update, the sanitation cost level and service, the Keep Charlotte Beautiful Cigarette Litter Prevention Program, and reconsideration of Harbor Walk West 2 area construction plans, and also urban farming and gardening in residential districts. If you would like to speak on any of those topics, now would be the time. Come to the podium, state your name. You will have three minutes. Okay, seeing none, we will move into the budget. And the first is we have appropriation of utility funds to the Water Authority. This is uh, per our contract with the Water Authority. It's $500,000, which will be their initial payment. Um, as soon as we get an invoice, uh, we will make the payment uh, for the uh, pipeline. And again, it's a, in accordance with all the agreements that have been adopted. Any questions? Move None. approval. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the appropriation. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried unanimously. And next we have appropriation for the five-year ADA assessment plan. Uh, again, this is not again. This is a requirement of our grant funding. It's a five-year ADA assessment plan. Um, it's gonna look at all of our facilities, parks and grounds, you name it, and come up with uh, our needs for the American Disabilities Act. It's something that we are required to do. Move approval. Second. second. We have a motion and a second to approve the appropriation for the ADA plan. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried unanimously. Okay, so now we get into something that will not take as long, uh, take <laughs> as quick. Everybody coming in? I didn't think you'd go so fast. <laughs> They're here for the trash talk. Well, <laughs> well we've since our, do since our trash talk here, yes. <laughs> do we want to go to the litter right now? Okay, so are they here? Is somebody here for that? Yes, somebody is here. Okay, for sorry, Kathy, we just preempted you. We're going to move on to <laughs> the Keep Charlotte Beautiful Cigarette Litter Prevention Program. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Rhonda Harvey from Keep Charlotte Beautiful, and we got the grant. The grant is for $5,000 to... Uh, place ash receptacles at entry exit points along the harbor walk um, and also use um, I wrote half of it for PSAs and to help educate the public because education is definitely where it's at um, we have been out um, passing out cigarette receptacles these are pocket ashtrays and these are car ashtrays uh, to everybody and their brother not just smokers, we also talk to people whose friends or family smoke. We want them to help us educate everybody as well. Um, we've been to a lot of festivals with those. We're also promoting the FDOT's uh, Drive It Home campaign. Their campaign has um, a part in it where it talks about not throwing stuff out the windows. 
and by writing their name on that board, that is helping them make that commitment publicly so that we can get them to stop throwing their ash, their butts out the window. So what I really need from you guys today is to make a decision on which receptacles you want and okay the locations for the ash receptacles. I put three up here. I love the one um, with the shark tail on top. It's adorable. I can only get two. I just contacted the gentleman this morning. He is a small business, very passionate about what he does, but this isn't his first line of work. So he has two left. Um, the other two I picked because they're customizable. We can put whatever we want on them to help encourage smokers to use them. Their parts are also replaceable. Therefore, if something happened to, say, the front panel, it can be removed and replaced. That's definitely an advantage. So are the materials between the $260 and the $451 different? Yes, the, the one in the middle is powder coated. The other one is stainless steel. Um, it looks nicer. I think it fits more with the, the Harbor Walk. It's, the railing is white. Um, either one is great, but I, I just like the stainless steel. Kim? Uh, I, will the powder coat last longer though? I mean, we don't want it to look like, you know, awful because of the rust. I mean, when you're putting it on the water on the Harbor Walk, it's really brutal on stuff. So which one would be more, uh, last longer? Well, the powder coat is way less expensive and would be easier for us to replace down the road the parts. Uh, the stainless steel is quite a bit more expensive. If it rusts, it, is, it would be more expensive to replace. Um, yes, sir. Do you happen to know what type of, I, it's a technical question, but do you happen to know whether that stainless is magnetic or non-magnetic? Oh. Or type 316 as opposed to a different yeah. type? No, sir, I am, I do not know. Oh, I could okay. find that out for you, though. Or that, that would be important in my mind because anything uh, lesser than a 316 will have, a, it will have more iron in it and a tendency to rust. So okay. So I have to know that. Okay. I, I can tell you that the... Uh, the really cute one with the, the shark tail, um, our fan, is that one we would really have to take care of. It, it will rust. Two years in, if we don't coat that with something, it will rust. Gary and then Nancy. Uh, Tom's point about the stainless steel is very important because we have a salt environment. And salt can be, a stainless is considered to be corrosive and resistant, but when it comes to salt, it can be just the exact opposite. Uh, so we do need to take that. Regarding the powder coating, are we customizable to the color that we would have it powder coated? Or do they offer it only as one color? I believe they only offer one color. I could ask them. They're, they, the customizable part is the uh, what we put on the front as far as... Um, I was actually thinking maybe we could use the uh, FDOT saying of keep our paradise litter free on the front, as well as the the county's logo and your logo, or Keep Charlotte Beautiful's logo and your logo to show who's in partnership on this. Nancy? Yeah, I just said as staff certainly would know about the powder coating because we've gone through lots of different um, uh, amenities that we've put on the Harbor Walk and what lasts and what doesn't last, so I would leave that discussion, or that Decision. Yeah, to, yeah that, you know, that would be fine. Mm -hmm. Mitchell and that as to, but I, w I would like to see us get the biggest bang for the buck and more of them because we, we certainly have gotten some feedback from um, residents about the litter in different spots along the Harbor Walk. Um, I, I like the idea of going with the, the less expensive one and putting in a few more. It, I really think that they've proven that smokers are only willing to go about 20 yards before they will drop their cigarette butt. Uh, we picked up in front of Hurricane Charlie's in a week's worth of cigarette butts is approximately 600 cigarette butts. Um, that's a lot in a week. So 
if um, so we could. You're, you're only showing these two locations on this agenda material. So where, how will we know where you where you're planning to put the others? We would have to. You would have to tell me where you would be okay with me putting them. Um, the also the other cost factor is the installation. The county said they would install those two if it was absolutely a perfect installation for three hundred dollars. So if we put in a couple more, maybe down by the harbor walk area where the tiki bar is, that might also be a really good area. Where do we have the dog? We have dog waste stations. Maybe they could be, you know, close to those. So for the maintenance, for the pickup effect, it might be draw more attention to it too. So it's not just standing out there by itself. I know there's one on the corner there by the mm -hmm. tiki. Um, well, why don't, I mean, does this need to come back to us? How many times do you want us to well? Yeah. Well, I, I, I would be comfortable with leaving the decision between those two up to staff based on a tolerance to the, to the environment out there as mm -hmm. Nancy su suggested. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. The, I would also mm -hmm. say, um, based on the feedback we received from residents that I've identified, and Howard, you go out on, the weekends and you see where all of the litter is and I realize that the business owners um, will go out and clean up as well but if we can encourage residents or visitors to um, do that themselves uh, perhaps some of these little um, uh, devices you have there could be distributed at the tiki bars to encourage people to <laughs> hurricane Charlie's has them already okay. so and yes you're right I should be at the tiki bar as well yeah. So why don't we just leave it up to staff and possibly put it back on a consent agenda just so we can see where you decide to put the other locations, the final deal. You want it back on an agenda? On the consent. Consent? Yeah. That's fine. I, I mean, that's fine. I don't really. Can so I say one where thing? the locations, yeah. where, go ahead. Um, I have to have them installed by about June 1st. I have a little leeway there, but that's, that's about it. I'd say go for it. Yeah. I'm yeah. good. I'm okay, good. then I'm just, good. yeah, I'm let good. the staff do it. Can't our staff install them? Oh. oh, what about that, Howard? <laughs> well, I'm just saying. Is it for the grant, the grant expenditure you need to spend the money, or why do you have to have them installed by June 1st? Um, I have to, they have a process. I have to go back and count the cigarette butts after I, they're installed. There's, there's a, wow. yes, that's wow. what I did with my, Friday, last Friday. Um, so I do have to go back and count them to see that we are making a difference. So yes, there's a process. Okay, go for we'll it. just go let it go, it go through Howard. Go you it. have your approval. Get maximum benefit for the yes. dollar and yep. go for it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. <clears throat> okay, now we're moving into trash talk. <laughs> <laughs> Other trash. Yes. Yeah. yeah. More trash. It's a trashy day. <laughs> By the way, as we discuss sanitation, we have over there on the side in the room, we have the uh, trash cart that we will be proposing next door to the recycling cart that we currently have. So you can see the size difference between the two. Good morning. I'm Kathy Mahar, Solid Waste Supervisor. Uh, we were asked to put some information together regarding alternative collection services. So we've gone through a, a few of them for you and given you some pros and cons on each uh, type of service. This is a rear load vehicle. It's the type of vehicle we use now. We can see that there'd be no changes for the residents in the way their service is picked up. Uh, since the residents own their own cans now, they can just put out household yard waste, uh, household waste, yard waste, and multifamily and commercial. Everything would be handled the same. Uh, we handle cans, bags, furniture, bulk items. Uh, whatever's out at the curb we pick up, basically. 
the trucks we would still have uh, could be considered spare trucks for any type of route when a truck goes down for service or issues. We can always grab one of the other trucks and use that. The cons we looked at were that these trucks <coughs> uh, require two employees. There's the constant need for the driver uh, or the employee to exit the cab of the truck and go back and forth to the rear of the truck, uh, giving them more exposure to the vehicle traffic around there. And uh, sometimes people just don't even notice there's a truck there, so that can be a problem. Uh, and the risk to injury for the employees. Uh, we've had people cut by broken glass. We've had needle sticks. We've had chemicals uh, go into the back of the truck. And we have overweight or oversized cans. That produces, again, more risk of injury to the employees. And that's a picture of the truck. Uh, please don't think I'm pushing Heil trucks or whatever. It was just easy to get pictures. But this is the one that we use for all of our collections right now. And the bid we have for the replacement right now is $249,000 per truck. The next one would be semi-automated, which would consist of tippers on the back of a railroad truck and carts issued to the residents. And that would be that cart there, which is, okay. Uh, there's two tippers mounted on the back of the truck uh, to retrofit existing trucks the tippers and the labor to retrofit them would be $2,850 per truck. 12,000. 12,000. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll just cut a deal. <laughs> <laughs> so that would be 12,850 per truck. Uh, to purchase a new truck with the tippers already installed would be 260,000. So you're looking at another $1,500 over the rear loader. My math is really off today. Uh, the pros and cons we considered on this was the carts. Uh, everybody likes the fact that it shows an orderly, orderly appearance throughout the neighborhoods, it's consistent. Uh, they're easy to get back and forth to the curb for the residents. They're on wheels. They're not that big. Uh, the employee exposure to injuries is reduced because they're not touching any of the waste inside. They can be retro retrofitted to what we already have, and it can handle two carts at once. The cons, the reduced flexibility. We can't pick up dumpsters when these are uh, put on the back of the trucks, the dumpsters don't match up and it causes uh, spill issues. You would still need two employees for ve per vehicle, someone on the back loading the carts and a driver. We don't really see any significant time saving with <clears throat> this. Uh, the cart is, I believe the dump time on a cart is eight seconds. Uh, the time right now we spend per home is about 30 seconds when you average it out across the city. So the time it would take the employee to roll it out, put it on the tipper and roll it back, and the tipper time <clears throat> probably works out to about the same as we're doing now. The residents will still have the bulk waste that won't fit in the cart. Uh, Anything that's on the ground, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that won't fit in the cart, we would have to handle either by picking it up and throwing it in the back of the truck, which we could still do. 
the additional cost of purchasing carts, uh, the, the prices we've looked at to take care of the city are about $499,000. Uh, this one is a totally automated uh, truck. It only has the ability to empty a truck with the sidearm there. It only requires one driver. Uh, the price we found on these is about $284,900. Again, you have the orderly appearance throughout the neighborhoods, easy to get back and forth, forth to the curb. Uh, the employee exposure is reduced because they're not touching anything. You only need one employee to operate the truck and that should produce significant time savings. The cons we found would, it would not allow, uh, it wouldn't work for dumpsters it wouldn't pick up the bulk waste or anything.